I'm going to, to introduce and to present uh, the update from the surveillance working group. Um, as you will see, this will be a summary and, uh, and the summaries are of course always reduced. Uh, second slide, please. So the first thing to be said is that uh, there are four priority thematic areas which were identified by the surveillance working group in October 20. We know that surveillance is at the heart of a lot of activities and all the pillars of the roadmap, but it's clear as well that it contains several components which have to be taken into account. And this resulted in, in the creation of four dedicated surveillance sub-working group. Next slide. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, the first one is the surveillance and global monitoring, which is uh, led by uh, Andrew Osman from the John Hopkins University and Nick Thompson from Sanger Institute. Uh, we have also the outbreak detection, investigation and response, which is led by Raul Calmadio, UNICEF. The hotspot, which is led by Elizabeth Lee from the John Hopkins University and the regional approaches to surveillance, which is led by Alexandra Medley from the Centers of Disease Control. Um, next one, please. What is important to, to mention is that um, in all these subgroups, the laboratory play an important role. And this is why we wanted to make this presentation, Marilo and myself, because uh, surveillance and the lab work are always intricated and very intricate. Um, let me mention that there are around 16 to 20 participants in each subgroup. And these, all these subgroups are very dynamic. Um, we had more than 20 subgroups meeting since the launch and two surveillance working group webinars to assure the good convergence of the puzzle pieces. I, I will first apologize to all the people, the people who are working in this um, in these groups because this is of course a summary and this is a very short summary and it's very difficult to represent all the richness of the discussions or reflections um, in these groups and among these groups. Next slide, please. So let's start with surveillance and monitoring subgroup. Um, I will always follow the same plan. First, the significance. Um, it is obvious that um, a robust routine monitoring based on indicators is paramount. Um, we, we run programs as we run cars, for example. If we don't have any data, if you don't see your landscape, you can be sure that you will have an accident. Um, any kind of program, preventive or curative, need data to be followed up, to be estimated, and this is very important. So the surveillance and the monitoring subgroup work for four hotspots to be identified in a reliable manner to effectively target interventions in the comprehensive and complementary action. And this is the axis two of the cholera mod roadmap. We have seen in the previous presentation that a more precise definition of hotspots is something which is important. And this group is working on that. Um, this is also to monitor the progress of the implementation of the national cholera plans, the NCPs, and the global cholera roadmap, of course. And, and, and the, the role is also to document with confidence the absence of local transmission. Next one, please. So there are a lot of work in progress uh, for this uh, for this subgroup, as for the other, the other ones as well. Well, um, it is mainly working on the minimum standard for indicator-based surveillance. So one of the job has been to review case definitions, suspected cases, confirmed cases, and consideration for probable case. This, is, this work is nearly completed. It means now the final discussions, but mainly a final decision. To identify epidemiological settings, including outbreaks, and recommend individual and collective testing strategies, but also an adequate surveillance method in each type of setting. 
The work which has to be done still is also to develop minimum standards for cholera indicator based surveillance, including core data set, reporting requirements, templates for APC traps, line list, etc. All the things which must be functional and uh, implemented in, uh, in the fields easily when it's possible and in com complementary to the other of systems. Next one, please. So the future work, well, there, there, are, there is still future work for the, for the group as for the other ones. Uh, this group will review data sources. They will review templates for cholera profile and maximize usefulness for users, as I mentioned it, and to develop a long-term vision action plan for global cholera database and country profiles. Regarding the documentation of absence of local transmission, this is to recommend the minimum surveillance standards and minimum documentation. Next one, please. So let's pass to the to the outbreak subgroup. Uh, well, as it's easy to understand, uh, one of the objectives is the early detection, the rapid confirmation, and the quick response to outbreaks, as we know that it has a, an important impact on the case fatality rate and, and on mortality. This is the first axis of the cholera roadmap, and it, once again, it's critical to mitigate outbreak impact. Next one, please. So in the work uh, which is done, uh, this, there is a revision of the DTFCC definitions criteria in different epidemiological settings for suspected cholera outbreak, cholera outbreak, and end of an outbreak. And here as well, the discussion has done go well, and uh, the work is nearly completed. Uh, but this is also to develop minimum standards and guidance for event based surveillance and community based surveillance. This is to develop criteria for evaluating sensitivity of cholera surveillance for timely detection and notification of cholera outbreaks in order, of course, to react as quick as possible and to foster innovation in cholera outbreak detection and forecasting the, the possibility of outbreaks. So what are the, the future work? For the outbreak investigation, it is important to develop standard operating procedures in case investigation forms and to evaluate timeliness of investigation of cholera outbreaks. It has been mentioned already, the reaction has to be quick, which means that uh, the investigation, of course, has to be as quick as possible. Um, there is also the, the outbreak response in case area targeted interventions, or well, the CATIs, everybody knows the CATIs. But the questions are, which are important are to define criteria to decide where to implement CATIs, to define the nature and the purpose of CATIs in different epidemiological settings, and to define minimum surveillance standards where CATIs are implemented, including for monitoring and for evaluation. Next one, please. The hotspot subgroup. Uh, well, I think that uh, everybody knows why the, the definition of the hotspot uh, is uh, it's so important. And the, the adequate identification of hotspot is critical to target interventions, of course across all roadmap pillars and to maximize their impact on the reduction of the cholera burden. This is also what allow um, to put all the pieces together to have a good complementary, comp sorry, a good complementary in, um, in, uh, in the pillars. Next one, please. So a review, um, no, let me rephrase. Um, it, it, the the hotspot methodology seemed a little bit old and sometimes inadequate, and this is why it has been revised. A review of 22 hotspots uh, identification has been conducted. Based on the findings of this review, um, guiding principles of a revised methodology have been identified. 
and the general framework of a draft revised methodology based on two steps is being developed. Um, this is done with representatives of all the GTFC's working groups, PILANS, and uh, all others have been consulted. Next one, please. So what, are, what is the work to be done still? Well, to continue to revise the DTFCC hotspots methodology, to, including data review exercise and simulation to finalize it, uh, to support the development of principles criteria for the strategic use and facilitate a more extensive use of uh, OCV. This implies uh, an increase of the stockpile for preventive vaccination and the support to the OCV working group. But in the future work, there is also the support to the development of minimum standards for cholera surveillance in hotspots, support to surveillance and monitoring and outbreak subgroups. Next one, please. Regional approaches subgroups. Well, the significance is quite easy to understand. Cholera has no borders, of course. Outbreaks of cholera are fueled by migration, political instability, environmental conditions, socioeconomic factors, and climate change. And this could be seen in the different illustrations, which were presented by Philippe Barbosa, for example. Cholera control or elimination in one country is unlikely to be stable unless all countries within connected regions aim to prevent cross-border or regional spreads. But of course, this requires strong collaboration and coordination between countries, subregions, and regions to progress towards cholera control and elimination and facilitate alerts in different countries and regions. I should say alerts and support. Next one, please. So, the work in progress. Um, this is to inform regional platform stakeholders, the GTFCC, the CSP, for the future development, strengthening, and streamlining of regional activities. To inform the development of a framework for cross-border coordination and cholera surveillance. To get an harmonized set of surveillance, preparedness, and response activities to be covered by regional platforms. And this has been drafted to get regional platforms activities which are being described against these activities through targeted discussions with regional platforms focal point. And this is a participative process, we insist on that. And of course, there is the involvement of the regional platforms, the WHO regional offices, regional cholera platform, CSP, and so on. Next one, please. So the future work, the future work is to finalize the landscape analysis of regional platforms. This is ongoing and should be quickly finalized. To develop a GTFCC regional surveillance framework regarding PWHs and regarding laboratory. To identify research questions to indicate cross-border or regional cholera connectivity, why does it pass? What are the factors and the risk factors? To study the role of the world genome sequencing to demonstrate the cross-border spread and the evolution of the, of the cholera, which is sometimes curious and which has to be studied. And to identify which factor may inform prevention of cholera importation. Next one, please. So, Regarding all of this subgroup uh, work, uh, there are a lot of challenges and uh, a lot of perspectives. Uh, first, uh, I will say that uh, one of the challenges is to maintain the high level of engagement. And it's not so easy. It's not so easy because uh, we request a frequent subgroups meetings. We know that we are working in a virtual, virtual format and everybody mentioned that this is not so friendly. And um, so um, thanks for the people for contributing um, by streaming and uh, to request for extensive contribution, of course. But um, there are other challenges. This is, of course, to capture the diversity of opinion 
there are a lot of opinions in these groups and, uh, and, and a lot of expertise and, and competencies and, and experience. And it is important to find the path for consensus and decision building. Well, at the end, I would say that uh, what is very important is to keep the systems, the Soviet systems, simple and efficient while adding research components, innovative IT tools, and engaging formats to be tested out. Next one, please. Um, I, will, I will mention all the people who work uh, on this group, but I would like to, to thank especially all the subgroups uh, leads, the surveillance group, working groups members, uh, and I will not mention all, but all the people who are working in, uh, in these groups and we are dedicating time, energy and experience. And uh, this is a fantastic collaborative work. Uh, next slide, please. And now I am very happy to give the floor to Marilo Kelisi, who will continue on the lab and the subgroups. Thank you, thank you, Mark, uh, for your presentation. And good morning, good afternoon uh, to everybody. So I will present now the, the, the lab working group and um, the work done by the lab working group. So as already mentioned by Mark, there was a strong involvement of the lab working group members in the four surveillance sub working groups. And all the discussions that we had highlighted the critical importance of lab data in conjunction with epidemiological data to improve cholera surveillance. And this was the case in all epidemiological settings, which were hotspot identification, detection, confirmation, and investigation, uh, and of outbreaks also, and long-term surveillance in persistent and non-persistent settings. So I have some, something is not working for me because I cannot see the slides. So um, can you help me with... Uh, I cannot see the slide, so sorry. Mm -mm. So um, mm -hmm. the indicators that we, uh, we discuss constantly were the number of suspected cases, which were tested by rapid diagnostic test, the proportion of rapid diagnostic test positive, uh, which were lab tested, and the proportion of lab confirmed cases. We also discuss the role of whole genome sequencing to demonstrate uh, the, and to understand and to monitor the regional and global cross-border spread. So uh, lab capacity should not be a limiting factor in the surveillance and it is important to improve lab tools and it is a priority. Uh, to improve lab tools and improve cholera surveillance. So the strengthening of lab capacities in countries is really uh, something that we have to, to develop more and more. So next slide, please. I cannot see, okay, thank you. So the key achievement of the lab uh, this year, we have concerning the lab capacity building, we could complete some job ads, and uh, these job ads are available as, on the GTFCC application. Um, so we have developed a uh, guideline for domestic transportation. And just I wanted to mention that all these guidelines have been developed in French and in English, and all are available on, in these two versions on the GTFCC application. So a, a guideline for domestic transportation of samples for lab confirmation of Vibrio cholerae. Uh, this guideline is included in the Wu Cholera Investigation Kit. Another guideline for the international transportation of cholera samples and strains uh, is also available so in English and in French. And this one is included in the Wu Cholera Lab Kit. So this, this um, document describes the condition of strength conditioning, the shipment internationally, and it includes also a preparation of samples before sending of strengths also uh, when it is the case and the logistical and administrative aspect of the shipment. We have also completed an antimicrobial susceptibility testing job 
for the treatment and control of cholera. And uh, it should be normally included in the future in the WHO cholera lab kit. We also have um, discussed and uh, updated the WHO cholera lab kit with some modification in the culture media included and other reagent. And we have also uh, made some changes in the antibiotics, antibiotics to be tested. And this is in agreement with the last technical note on the use of antibiotics for the treatment and control of cholera. Uh, another point of interest and, uh, was to, to understand the, the request and the needs of the countries concerning the lab capacities. So um, a questionnaire to survey a national control plan engaged country um, was developed and this uh, wanted to, to make a point on the needs for minimal, minimum pardon, technical capacity. And this has been drafted and it is um, currently in a, under evaluation in Mozambique. And in this document, the lab working group partners have defined the minimum essential technical capacity for the countries. And this was discussed uh, during a webinar, a lab webinar, which was uh, in January 2021. Next slide, please. So the action in progress, uh, we still have to develop a bibliocholeric culture procedure. This should be edited quite uh, rapidly, I think, I hope so. We also wanted to discuss a uh, procedure for PCR. It is something that we discussed for a long time, but it is not so easy to, um, uh, to develop because we have to, to discuss uh, about the methodology. Uh, I mean, uh, the methodology of procedure for um, conventional or real-time PCR. And uh, we would like to use also commercially available kits for the real-time PCR, but they are very expensive. And also they are limited to the use of specific um, thermocyclers. So um, we have also um, initiated the development of uh, the opening of a Dropbox and a share uh, asked to the different partners of the lab working group to, uh, to send uh, their procedural manuals. Uh, used uh, in their lab. So uh, what we would like also to discuss extensively, and it is very important, is the use of the rapid diagnostic test. So the role of field application of rapid diagnostic tests is something very uh, extensively discussed. And um, a, a rapid diagnostic test uh, performance review has been performed by Amanda Debes from John Hopkins University. And the objective of this document was to make a review uh, of the literature about uh, RDT performance. Also to have more um, notion of the importance of the role of en enrichment and to examine the use of rapid diagnostic tests in different prevalence context, context. A summary of this study has been done by David Olson, and there were discussion of uh, threshold for probability, for probability required to use clinical case definition, combined with RDT results as a basis for declaring outbreaks. So the objective is to arrive at consensus decisions on the role of cholera rapid diagnostic tests for outbreak detection and response, and also for cholera monitoring. And this is something that we will extensively discuss uh, with the World Surveillance Working Group. So next slide, please. So the work plan, as I, I, as I have already mentioned, we will discuss um, the RDT use in collaboration with epidemiology surveillance lab working groups. And um, we will don't continue the discussion so on the basis of, of the documents that I have presented just before. And uh, possibly we would like to implement the, a revised surveillance standard such as the increased use of rapid diagnostic tests. Uh, we will discuss also a testing strategy because we have to discuss the tools for the, for the testing, but also the strategy and in particular geographic and temporal completeness during routine surveillance for outbreak detection, during outbreak monitoring also. 
and response for the end and elimination of, so of cholera. And uh, another point that we would like to discuss is also to have um, uh, some vision concerning uh, countries' laboratory capacities uh, on other pathogens than cholera, because it seems that some countries have a lab capacity on other pathogens, and we would like to synergize uh, laboratory activities if possible. So it is something that we plan to discuss in the future. And for that, uh, close articulation and coordination between lab and epi working groups is critical. And um, next slide, please. I think that for me, it is okay. It is uh, sufficient for, it is exactly what I wanted to, pro to present. And now I hand over to Mark comments on the Cholera Roadmap Research Agenda, because I think it mainly concerns AP activities. So thank you, Mark. Yeah, thanks very much, um, Marie-Laure. Um, and um, I'm going to, to present, of course, very quickly, um, the research priorities for epidemiology surveillance in the laboratory. Um, let, me, let me first say that uh, we have, um, we have some tools that are not really perfect as it, as it has been mentioned, but um, it clearly and definitely something which would be very important will be the way we use them, what kind of strategy, how do we combine them. Mm -hmm. So these questions are related very often to this objective. The first one, the first question is what is the impact of early diagnosis of cholera using a rapid diagnostic test at the point of care in a community setting compared with testing only in health facilities. We can see here the important role which could play the rapid diagnostic test. The second question is how can we improve and fine tune hotspot definition in, and identification at the district and sub-district level? And as we mentioned, it has been mentioned several times, this is an important point to be more precise, more focused, and of course, more efficient. The third question is what are the optimal designs for surveillance systems? Uh, Indicator-based, event-based, community-based, environment, environmental sentinel, uh, sorry, environmental sentinel site surveillance to monitor progress of the cholera world map. The fourth question, of course, is very important. What are the optimal surveillance tools, laboratory methods, case definitions to monitor progress of the cholera roadmap being usable, of course, in the different field? How can we combine epidemiological and a genomic analysis for Vibrio cholera to be used for better understanding transmission dynamics and inform epidemiological models. And this is, of course, an important question to understand how do the, the cholera spread. Um, next one, please. Uh, there, there are a lot of people who are working in the working group memberships. I feel a little bit uncomfortable because I, I think that it's important to um, well, first to mention them, but uh, I'm not going to read all the names. I give you some time to, to read, of course, all the people who are working. And the next slide, please. This is all the people who are working for the lab working group membership. Um, and as you can see, there are uh, quite a lot. And um, in, in both groups, and I would like to repeat that, there is a, a huge level of uh, competency and, and experience, which has to be combined, of course, which is not always very easy, but uh, which is very rich. Next one, please. I would like to thank you for your attention.